Okay, so hello everybody. I'm here on a very special day uh, to introduce a book and um, written by my friend Andrew Duncan Shaw. Um, not used to the middle name. Um, so Andrew wrote this book, three seven three Melusine, and um, I did the book cover for him. And you'll notice that there's lots of willow leaves in the cover. We'll talk about that a bit more. Um, today we're in the days of willow and it's actually a very special day because um, it's full moon today. And the full moon in the days of willow brings the magic of the polarity between Pisces and Virgo. So Virgo is the maiden and Pisces is the fish. So the fish and maiden combined make the celestial mermaid, the lady of the lake, Melusine in French occultism. And there's lots of uh, late medieval lore about Melusine and the Isle of Avalon. Um, very interesting. Anyway, Andrew, how are you doing? Very good, thanks. And, uh, you know, it's two days tomorrow that we first met. Two, really? Uh, two days tomorrow in Froome, yeah. I'll just look at the messages. Was that last year or 2022? I can't last remember. Year, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, Andrew contacted me a couple of years ago to see if I would be up for just doing his book cover for him. Um, of course, I didn't know what his book was about. And so he sent me some of his writings, which back then were some kind of poems and um, visionary pieces hard to describe them really prose maybe um and what the original interest was that a lot of his writings were inspired by working on the sacred landscape of the glastonbury zodiac so uh, uh, there's many many pieces of writing and prose that correspond with different parts of the glastonbury zodiac um and so andrew thought i would be suitable uh, for his book cover artwork. When I read some of Andrew's poetry, um, it, I found it really quite haunting, um, very similar to the poetry of Fiona MacLeod. Um, not the same as Fiona MacLeod, but what was similar was the otherworldliness of it, and when I read Fiona MacLeod writings, the hairs on my neck prickle. And there's something other about it, something from the other world totally being channeled through. And that's what I that's how I reacted to Andrew's writing, that there was something other coming through that made the hairs on the back of my neck prickle, you know. So I'm not not all of the pieces, of course, it's, but a lot of them incredibly haunting. So I, I had no hesitation in agreeing to do the cover artwork for it. Back then, um, I'm always happy to promote the Glastonbury Zodiac, but equally with my own inner world stuff, I work with my muse I work, uh, and that divine Feminine, that is my muse, is a big part of my psyche and my creativity. And it's very personal. It is personal awareness, personal gnosis, um, and that dialogue between yourself and your muse. And Andrew's poetry and prose are exactly the same. I, I, I could see he was writing from the first person, exploring landscape and interacting with the divine feminine, which is sometimes the goddess of the coming age. But equally, it's his own inner muse as well. And and so, yeah, incredibly haunting. And, and I'll stop with that bit and just let Andrew describe the book himself for a few minutes. And then I'm going to read the preface. So, Andrew, how would you describe it to complete 
beginners that know nothing about you or the book? Right. So about 12 years ago, uh, out of the blue, I had a very vivid dream, which seemed to be directed by uh, a young lady um, who took me in an out of body state uh, to, and then showed me this dream like it was a film. And I, I was almost awake while I was watching this film in bed. Um, and it was an incredible experience. And not, uh, the, the most incredible thing about it was there was a, another person met directing it all. And it was like I was, I was being shown something. For a specific purpose, although I couldn't figure out what that purpose was, um, and um, so I had this this dream. It was about the future and a, quite a dystopian future. Uh, an organisation uh, using some kind of pseudo Egyptian symbolism had taken over the world and now controlled everyone and everything. Uh, and that was the future I found myself in. Uh, that was about 2012, uh, and from then I, I, I was possessed with a, a desire to figure out the meaning of this dream. And while I was being shown it, what could be done about it to, to help the future. Uh, now, in my um, travels in trying to trying to understand it all, I discovered poetry, and through this poetry, I discovered the White Goddess by Robert Graves, and also uh, um, the Prophetess, as described in the Isle of Dreams by Fiona MacLeod. And through that, I ended up. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but I ended up with my muse, as Yuri says. Um, who I, just, who I named Melazine after the myth, the French myth, which really caught my imagination when I read it. I think I read a version of it by uh, Gareth Knight. And that the very first version of poetry I wrote, uh, which it was trying to explain uh, the dream, uh, had Melazine in it um, as, as a mermaid and the daughter of Manon and Maglia. Uh, and I understand um, there's, there's a connection there, which I didn't understand at the time. Now, the, the book evolved over, over 10 years, and um, it started off as, as stream of consciousness poetry. At one stage, I wrote a novel. I tried to write a novel about it all, uh, and then that's where I get the prose style from. Uh, and then finally, I wrote the version that Yuri has in his hands. Uh, what, what it ended up being about was a journey through the countryside, because I was inspired by all sorts of things, including the Glastonbury Zodiac and the Michael and Mary Lee lines. And I took, I went on a journey around uh, the, the glass of Zodiac with my muse, Melazine. And uh, from there, we, we we went all around the countryside, all around Somerset, went to Avery, uh, along the Lee Lines to Carnley Boyle. And eventually we ended up at Glastonbury Abbey at the altar for the grand climax. Uh, but it's, it's, it was kind of hard for me to figure out who Melazine was through all of that. And... Um, in the end, I decided that she was the prophetess, as described by Fiona MacLeod in the Isle of Dreams. And the, the goddess uh, was uh, was above her, but she was like an avatar of the goddess. Uh, and that's who Melazine became in my my book. And the, and the book closed with, um, well, it, it, it's, it's in two parts. Essays is about the, the patriarchal age over the last 2,000 years. Uh, and then the poetry, which is part two, is all about Melazine as my muse, uh, describing the next 2,000 years, which hopefully is, going, hopefully is going to be dominated by the divine feminine. So it's really a travelogue around Somerset and the surrounding country, counties in the companionship of this lady called Melazine. And the, uh, the awareness of the transition of ages from the age of Pisces yes, yeah. to the age of Aquarius. Yeah, I think it's a very exciting time at the moment to, to, to be alive, really. Yeah. To, uh, for people that don't know, Aquarius traditionally was governed by the queen of the gods. So in Greek mythology, that's Hera, and in Roman mythology, Juno. And from a Celtic perspective, all of the Celtic queen deities like Morrigan or Brigid, Brigantia, Rhiannon, they're all divine feminine queens. And, and that's the essence of the age of Aquarius. Specifically, maybe Bridget, because Aquarius holds Bridget's festival of Imbolc. So in a thousand years time, there will be a cosmic Imbolc in the age of Aquarius. You know, so we're in interesting times, this transition from the patriarchal age of Pisces to the hopefully matriarchal age of Aquarius. Um, hopeful is the wrong word, it's definite. You know, yeah. the, the, the female is rising. Well, it is, and me too, and social media and all sorts of stuff like that's helped it. And uh, and you can see the the, you know, the demonstrations in Iran about wearing hijab and so on. 
Uh, there's things going on which would never have gone on in, 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 as little as 20, 30 years ago. So we were definitely we we're definitely going in the right direction. But uh, as I think you said earlier today, the patriarchal age is having its last say in things like Gaza and Ukraine. It's, it's just disgusting what's going on there. Yeah, and it's right. never happened in, in a matriarchal uh, society. I, I see it as the death rattles of a dying thing, you know, uh, literally saber rattling and rifle shaking. It's just horrible. Yeah. You know, monstrous. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to read the preface, which is only, um, I think, what is it, two pages? Okay. And I'll try not to bumble it. I haven't rehearsed or anything. The book is a hardback. Um, it's about 330 pages. So there's tons of interesting, juicy, beautiful writing in here. Some of it is comedy as well and some of it's just profound haunting insights and some of it is surreal because it's personal gnosis from uh, Andrew's inner visions and stuff but here's the preface where's my glasses oh I need glasses for these okay <clears throat> can you hear the music of the fae in the background ambience play can you see that i am here though all around those books you hold so dear yet i am here is not so far yonder on the other side of a river adorned with rowan trees and silver beams of moonlight trace these very words you read in haste are ah, by day the twittering of birds. For is moonlight the essence of this place, infuse into your idle dreams, my breath the breeze onto your sleeping face, my words as wind chimes that call and wake you with a start, and see you that I am before you, though you know me not, and see you, I am fair, of face, I see you stare, of strawberry and dawn skies, my hair, the essence of my soul, by her, into your racing heart, I've stole. Though this you will not know, until, until the fairy realm, we go, where the most eluding of flowers, in full bloom is senseless. The scent of all such flowers is shameless. And Beethoven's apicionato is wordless. So that's the preface. Um, the book is in two halves. The first half is essays, essays um, which Andrew's called mail. And uh, he can explain that in a minute. And the second half is female. And it's kind of that transition from Age of Pisces to Age of Aquarius and the, the return of the divine feminine. But I'll let Andrew continue explaining. Right. So um, the, uh, uh, the the book was written in two parts. Well, it was originally just poetry, because when I sent it off to Yuri to get the cover done, um, it was just poetry at that stage, which is part two now. But then Yuri said, uh, I should really explain things a little better. I'd write a few essays at the beginning. Uh, so uh, I, I did that and write, wrote a few essays. Um, but uh, I ended up um, designing part one and part two. So part one was the was represented of the last 2,000 years of patriarchy, um, which summed up by the chaos and disorder that, that uh, it governs part one in the storyline. And part two was... It's supposed to represent the next 2,000 years of uh, human history, which will be under the divine feminine. So the, the book really has two parts uh, as a kind of um, record of the of the last 2,000 years and a hope for the next 2,000 years. That, that's the idea of it. So when you first contacted me, the, the attraction was familiarity with the Glastonbury Zodiac and landscapes of the Glastonbury Zodiac. But as our friendships grew you became quite influenced by the Owen Grove. Yeah, I just discovered that as I was finishing off the book. And in fact, the Owen Grove is in there 
in several yeah. places. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the part one is dedicated to uh, three of the nine muses uh, because it was Willow when I first discovered the Own Grove. Uh, and um, uh, and then there's a section that in the beginning which mentions uh, the Own Grove in the introduction. Uh, and then there's the ending is all the Own Grove. It's re it represents the ceremony we had at Dundon Beacon uh, last year. So, so la not everyone might know, last year we had off the Owen Grove Facebook groups existed since 2015. But last year, 2023, we had our first gathering outside cyberspace. A, a, a good dozen of us met in Somerset and had a weekend of Owen Grove activities. And we concluded with a rather spontaneous ceremony at Dundon Beacon and invoking the goddess Nematona, she of the sacred grove. So that's inspired your epilogue or something? It did, yes. Uh, it really, I wish I had discovered it earlier because I could have um, infused the whole book with the Iron Grove. But I'm, I've got plans for, for my next project. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, it will all be Iron Grove. Uh, but I absolutely loved the whole idea of it. And uh, it, was, it was a late influence in the book. What does 373 stand for? Because right, the, the, the title of the book is 373 Melusine. Yes, so, so the story behind that is that originally I had it uh, called, well, I had it called Gwen, Guinevere. How do you pronounce the Welsh version of Guinevere? Guinevere, yeah, English, uh, Gwenhifwa. Oh, I don't yeah. know for certain. Yeah. It's, it's going to be Middle Welsh, you know, but yeah. Gwenhifwa, yeah. Yeah, so um, what was the question again? Uh, 373, know. yes, yeah. 373. Originally, I had titles like that, and then a later title was Love Letters to Aletheia, um, which would take some explaining. But um, I was, as I was, after finishing the book off, I started to get a bit nostalgic for the future I saw in that dream. And in that dream, I was part of the resistance against the, uh, the, the authoritarian government that had taken over. And I started thinking, I've, I've written this book to them for, for the future. And I need something a bit more militaristic than, say, like a, a more softer title, like Love Letters to Alethea. It didn't really fit uh, what I was trying to, trying to do there. Uh, so I started searching Malazine, uh, because she's obviously the central figure of especially part two. And I come across, uh, there's not much, but I come across uh, an entry for 373 Malazina, which turns out to be an asteroid between Jupiter and Mars. And that had, uh, and I envisioned that as, as an asteroid coming to Earth to impact and, and change civilization. Obviously, it's a metaphor. I don't actually want an asteroid yeah. to hit us. But, um, but a shift, of a, a change, a shift. Yes, yes. So yeah. I imagine, I'm imagining the goddess coming to us like an asteroid to, to change everything and, and give us a new start. And, and um, also, three, this asteroid, 373 Melazina, is between Mars and Jupiter. And in the Kabbalah, Mars and Jupiter is, is mercy and severity. And I imagine the goddess coming to us in this new age um, between the two, depending on how we respond to her. So she could come with mercy or she could come with severity or a bit of both. So I thought the title was perfect, really. So uh, that, that's what does behind that. Yeah. And today um, I hadn't even thought about it. I, I hosted a Zoom meeting last night about the willow tree and we were looking at um Mananan McClear and, and things and talked about Melusine a little bit in that because of the polarity between willow and blackthorn which is Virgo and Pisces and I explained how Virgo and Pisces made this heavenly mermaid Melusine um, but the exact moment of that Virgo Pisces polarity is going to be the full moon in willow which is today and you actually sent me a message saying happy melusine day and I, <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that before but it was perfect yeah the full moon in willow would be melusine day because that everything's aligned with the sun and moon and that celestial mermaid yes so, you did the cover with uh, willow didn't you yeah and i hadn't even thought of that and so it was doing this little video now was spontaneous. Uh, neither of us had planned to promote Melusine today, um, but it's perfectly right to do so. Uh, I found wonderful. that yesterday. That was Melusine day today. I can believe it. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's not officially Melazine Day. I did look up her official feast day, which she doesn't have one. No. As far as I can tell, she's not a saint. So uh, there's such thing as a Melazine feast day. But we can make it so, can't we? Yeah, so every time there's a full moon in Pisces, uh, yeah, that's full moon in Virgo sort of thing. So, yeah, it will always be in the days of Willow. That full moon will be Melusine Day. Yeah, I'm going to celebrate <laughs> next year for sure. I'm going to, have a, I'm going to have a fireworks display next year. Yeah, make a big splash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want to read one of your pieces? Was this yeah, about... Yeah, yeah. It's really short, um, as a lot of the chapters are in, in part two. Um, but uh, this is, I was with Melazine going around the Zodiac, and we've arrived at East Pennard Hill. This is uh, the Glastonbury Zodiac. Yes, yeah. Glastonbury Zodiac, yes. So in, at East Pennard Hill, uh, there's a, well, I don't know if you know, but there's a, there's a fake stone circle quite near where the uh, Glastonbury Festival is. And then there's, there's a stone dragon where, where a stream goes through it, and it comes out of its mouth. It's, it's a, actually there in the landscape, these details. Yeah. So that's right. These are features of the landscape, a dragon and a stone circle. Yes, yeah, they're actually there. I think it's private land. Yeah. Um, it's quite hard to find. But I, I can't remember how I found it. Um, but it's it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating place. But I think it might be part private. I'm not really sure. But I've never seen anyone there. And uh, so I'm with Melazine at East Pennard Hill. And in my book, uh, I talk about the goddess directly uh, with a capital H for her. Uh, and Melazine is, is her avatar, so I prefer to have a small H for her. And we're here together at East, at East Pennard Hill, and uh, I'll just read it out. Yeah, read it nice and slow. Slow, right, okay, yeah. On a niche in midst the East Pennard Hills is a faux stone circle built around festival time, with a dragon nearby through whose body a stream flows, as does the dragon through the seams of the earth. He was slain time and time again, timeless aeons passing through into the night. Yet in due course it will be dawn, and then will the ancient spirit resurrect. And now, behold the lady pouring her benefaction upon the world. Behold the new ages arrive, so that the ancient place in her hearts will be resurrected once more. Behold the stream that flows on through the dragon's heart. See it all and rejoice. Redemption is at hand. And the dragon, which St. Michael had pinned into the interior of the tor in order that discord may be banished, the dragon will live once more, sinuously reviving the earth and restoring it to her throne. And she will be with us and within us, and without the golden age begins. Winter is here, the nights are drawing in now. Frost, maybe snow, will carpet the old early morning lands of Avalon from now. But this will be a prelude to the glorious springtime, said Melazine, impassioned once more. As I watched on from afar, the first snowdrops in the abbey grounds when flowering plants come out to bloom, one after another in a carnival of ornately carved petals and freshly budded leaves. And Melazine smiled gently at the imagery in my mind that she had evoked, and she watched with me as the months rolled into May, and the laburnum begins to, began to erupt in bright yellow gems all radiating the essence of the goddess. And then I saw clearly that there is no maiden to be saved, it is her that presides over night and dragon. She who is to be, the balm of the world. It is Gwen her father, and it is to her I desire to approach. And when I am near, I shall be as the phoenix that burns to ash and resurrects the sun from slumber amidst the molten clouds. Lovely. That she is the balm of the world. That's from Fear of the Cloud. Is it? Yeah, I'm always quoting that line. Yeah, lovely. So, um, yeah, I, I guess, how would you describe your book then? That, that there's, it's being inspired, inspired by sacred landscape, actually going out into the world and, and walking amongst those trees and fields and, yeah. and the esoteric history of Glastonbury and Avalon, but then walking with your inner muse and perceiving wisdom from her about the return of the divine feminine. Yeah, because I started off 10, 10, 12 years ago with no idea what I was doing. Now I've ended up here um, with the divine feminine and the, and the coming age, new age. Uh, so that I was led there um, by by just the the route I took. And I ended up, I've ended up in Glastonbury in Brighton when this all this happened. Uh, and, uh, and because of the Glastonbury Zodiac anthology uh, that you put together. I was, I was just desperate to come to Glastonbury someday, and then I got made redundant and had the chance to do so. 
Uh, and then three years ago, I moved to Glastonbury, and um, many things have happened since I moved there, all good things, uh, and, and all, all various strands of the life have all come together uh, in, in Glastonbury since I moved here. It's, it's been absolutely brilliant. And, and one of the things was to get this book finished, and the hardest part was editing the whole thing together, because I had several versions with all the bits which could be put in. I had to sort of add it all into a coherent whole, and I managed to do that, so not until... I, I, I moved to Glastonbury, so it's, it's just been fantastic for me. Yeah. And, and your help as well has been invaluable. I, I never have got this far without you. So, um, so thank you very much, Yuri. It's, it's, all, it's all the great work of bringing her with a capital H yes. into the world. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, everybody, um, it's available on Amazon. It's 373 Melusine by... The Birth of New Worlds by Andrew Duncan Shaw. And it's a hardback, 330 pages or so, lots of inspirational writing. And I think it will trigger people. I, th I think it will help people make internal connections and, and help them with their own explorations of communion with their, their muse as well. You know, I think... I have this idea now that the anima mundi or the spirit of the world, the first point of contact with that is your inner muse and everybody has their own inner muse and that's their point of contact with the spirit of the world, if you like, you know, and the world is transitioning into the age of Aquarius. So if you don't make those internal connections with your inner world, you, you, you're on the outside. You're not in, you're not connected, you know? And so your book might be quite abstract to some people, but I think the writings will also trigger people and open people. I really believe in it. So I, I, I hope it does well for you. Yeah, well, I, I'm, it's not me it needs to do well for. I'm hoping this will help change the future for the better. That's what my ambition is. That's what I imagined that the lady at the foot of the stairs uh, wanted me to do. It's not just an idle project. So I am, I'm hoping for it to have an impact in the real world. Um, so to me, it's just been a fantastic journey. Uh, my, my own personal development has been fantastic. But I'm hoping it will have a wider impact. Um, because I feel like I was set a task. Uh, that day when I had that dream, and uh, yeah. this is the completion of it on Melusine Day. Melusine Day. Yeah. <laughs> Any full moon in the days of Willow is Melusine Day. It is. It is yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful, Andrew. Thank you, and good luck with it. I'll just stop recording, and then we'll wrap up. Mm -hmm.